Welcome to part 2 of the Exposure Triangle videos. Here we will cover real-world applications of deciding what settings are best to use in a particular scenario. If you haven't watched part 1, I highly recommend you do so as it covers all the theory that we will be applying in this video. So in part 1 we covered stops of light and adjusting our settings in stops of light. But as you have probably realised by now, you can choose from thousands of possible combinations to get a correct exposure. In this video I will show you some practical examples so you can quickly narrow down the settings to the best combination. Now one point to note here is that you need to be aware of what is going to be happening when you take the photo or the look you want to achieve ahead of time so you can dial in the settings and be ready to take the picture. I also need to mention that in the following examples the final settings we are going to arrive at may not necessarily be the settings I use to take these photos. Anytime you want to take a photo the lighting conditions will be different so the following exercise will show you how to use the feedback from your camera to quickly arrive at the correct settings. So let's start with this image of a flying pig. Like any photo you need to ask yourself what is stationary, what is moving, what do you want sharp and what you want blurry. In this example we have a flying pig so it will be moving fast. Since there is movement we have the option of freezing motion or blurring motion. In this case we want to freeze the motion so a fast shutter speed will be important. So you turn on the camera and these just happen to be the settings from a previous photo you took. You look through the camera and see the following light meter reading. This shows us we're two stops overexposed. Now we have three ways to bring down the exposure by two stops. By speeding up the shutter, by closing down the aperture or by decreasing the ISO. So what do we do? Well in this case we know that we want to freeze the motion and the pig will be moving at speed. Looking at our shutter speed, 1 25th of a second is way too slow to freeze the motion here. If we speed up the shutter to 1 500th of a second, that would be enough to freeze the action. Moving to 1 25th to 1 500th of a second also happens to be two stops of light, so our exposure is fixed. Now, if you have watched my video on ISO, you might be tempted here to reduce the ISO to 100, which would lose you another stop of light and you can compensate for that by opening the aperture to f4. Although technically correct from an exposure perspective, the pig is moving towards the camera, so there will be a slight delay between locking focus and taking the photo in which time the pig will have moved. So our 5.6 aperture works well here as it gives you enough depth of field to still get the pig in focus. In this next example we have a llama in a dark barn. Again turning on our camera it just happens to be set like this and the camera meter shows two stops underexposed. So you ask yourself what is stationary, what is moving, what do you want sharp, what do you want blurry. Now at first this might look like a still image. But animals like llamas don't stay in the same spot for very long, especially when you point a camera at them. The easiest way to find two stops of light is to open up the aperture to f2.8. It will give you a shallow depth of field, but that's okay, that could work. So technically our exposure is fixed. However, I would be concerned that the llama is moving, so I might change the shutter to 1 2 50th of a second just to make sure you get the shot. This would make the exposure one stop underexposed, so increasing the ISO to 400 makes the exposure correct again. In this example, we have a jogger running towards the camera. Just like before, you turn your camera on, which just happens to have these settings, and the light meter shows you one stop underexposed. So, what is stationary? What is moving? What do you want sharp? What do you want blurred? The jogger is obviously going to be moving. Looking at the shutter speed, that is way too low to freeze the action. So we increase the shutter to 500th of a second. But by doing this, we lose two stops of light, bringing us to three stops underexposed. Now, just like with the flying pig, the jogger is moving towards the camera, so a shallow depth of field will make it almost impossible to get a shot in focus. Therefore, aperture is out. So the only thing left is ISO. 
needing three stops, we increase the ISO from 200 to 1600, giving us the needed three stops of light to correct the exposure. Moving on to the studio portrait, again, what is stationary, what is moving, what do you want sharp, what do you want blurred? In this case, we are in control of all the elements and we can easily ask the model to freeze for a sec so we can take the photo. Since nothing is moving, let's start with the ISO. Being a studio shot, let's drop it to 100 to give us the best quality possible. That brings us to two stops underexposed. Now depending on the lens and your hand holding ability, or if you have a tripod, you could drop the shutter speed to a 60th of a second giving you back one stop, and changing the aperture to f4 will give you the second stop of light. Portraits at f4 look amazing, so that's not an issue. Your model should be able to hold still for a 60th of a second, giving you a sharp image, and at 100 ISO, you will get the best quality. Hopefully by now, you're seeing the thought pattern and things are starting to make sense as to how to choose your settings. I just have two more examples to bring this home. In this photo, the only landscape shot I've ever taken. We turn the camera on, we check the exposure, and we ask the standard four questions. What is stationary? What is moving? What do you want sharp? What do you want blurred? Since this is a landscape shot, we preferably want everything sharp. Other than the water, nothing is moving. I am also going to assume that as a landscape photographer, you have your tripod with you. So since the water is moving, do we care if it's blurred? In this case, not really. Blurred water can give you a silky look which looks amazing in landscape images. So let's go over the settings. Currently, our meter is showing three stops underexposed. Now in practice, this means three stops or more, but we will assume that for this demo that it's three stops. Since we want a clean landscape image with everything in focus, let's start by dropping the ISO to 100, which loses us a stop of light, and closing the aperture down to f16, which loses yet another three stops of light. So now we are seven stops underexposed. Since we have our tripod and blurry water doesn't bother us, the easy fix is to slow down the shutter by seven stops. So following our chart, we can see that our shutter speed of one second will get us the seven stops that we were missing, resulting in a perfect landscape shot. In this final image, I wanted to tell a story how people cross the road here without the traffic stopping. So just like before, turning the camera on, we get these settings and the light meter gives us this reading. Just like before, we ask the same questions. What is stationary? What is moving? What do you want sharp? What do you want blurred? In this case, we want the cars to be blurred to show movement. Ideally, we want the girl to be frozen, but it's not a deal breaker if she has a little motion blur. We want the scene to be sharp and we don't really care too much about depth of field. So, first thing we do is slow down the shutter to a 60th of a second. That should be slow enough to give us the motion blur we are looking for. This also gives us back one stop of light. For the second stop of light, you have the choice of either open the aperture to f4 or increase the ISO to 400. To be honest, both options will work well here, so this just comes down to your own personal preference. Personally, although the girl is not moving fast, she's still moving towards the camera, so I would leave the aperture at 5.6 and increase the ISO to get this shot. But again, either way will work in this scenario. The final point I want to make is that in all these examples, we adjusted our settings by a full stop. This is just for simplicity to get you thinking about how each setting affects your image. But in reality, your camera can change settings in a third of a stop, giving you much more precise control of the exposure. I really hope these examples helped you make sense of all these settings and the process to pick the best settings for the scenario. If some things are still a little confusing, watch this video again or comment below and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you have. So thanks for watching this Take Corner video. As always, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos.